Welcome to the Millerville Community Church podcast of our Sunday morning sermon series, where the Word of God is always the focus of our hearts and prayers. Praise the Lord. Merry Christmas. I've uh, been wishing people... <laughs> I've been wishing people Merry Christmas for many years and uh, I always begin on the first Sunday of Advent and then go on from there and people tell me, oh, you're way too early, it's not Christmas yet. But Christmas actually begins with the Advent season as we celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, not just in the past, but his soon return because the Lord is coming again and we are really looking forward to that day when he answers our prayers and returns in all his glory. I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of his spirit, and I hope you will know him today. May the Lord help you find what you are looking for this very Christmas day. We believe what we all are really looking for is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. It is in him you're going to find what you've been seeking this Christmas. Jesus Christ is literally God incarnate. He is God in the flesh. God revealed in the flesh of a human being. We can't know everything about an all-knowing, all-present, all-powerful God. Can we all admit that right now? We can't know everything about that. He's God after all. But we find in Jesus Christ our Lord, Father God, revealed in him. And what he reveals is the essential character of God. He doesn't reveal all his power, all his knowledge, all his might, but his very essential character. As I read that passage from Philippians about how Jesus did not consider equality with God to be grasped, but emptied himself, he reduced himself, he boiled himself down to the essentials of God so that you and I with our little brains and with our small souls could comprehend God's essential nature. Jesus was a stripped-down version of Father God. He was reduced to his absolute essentials. And God is known not best not by what he can do, by his abilities, but he is known best by his character. And his character is best known by his motive. Today I want to help you comprehend the great miracle of God getting down on our level and experiencing an encounter with him through Jesus Christ. We look at uh, three verses today, and through them we're going to try to help you understand the wonder of Christmas, his coming as Jesus Christ as a Savior, and his soon coming as Judge. And before we go further, before we get our brains around this amazing event of Christmas and what it all means, we've got to address three blocks in our soul this morning. Three things that will keep us from understanding and receiving what will be shared from the Bible and uh, revealed in the three scriptures we're going to look at. These blocks are our past misunderstandings of Father God, and they're getting in our way of understanding who he is. Many of us have looked at God through the Old Testament, and we read about all the wars and all the violence going on there, and we have concluded that God is an angry, wrathful God, much like our angry, abusive fathers might have been in the past. We have looked at God through creation and through the theories of evolution and everything else, and we have concluded that God is distant and an uninvolved God who does not care about what goes here on earth. Otherwise, he would pay a carbon tax, right? We have concluded that science, with all its many theories and science's best guesses, because that's what they are, only to conclude that there is no God, and if there is a God... He's long dead, now killed by philosophies and evolution. All these ideas about God are developed by looking at something other than Jesus Christ. And you're making a conclusion on incomplete information, and you could only partially be correct at best and horribly wrong at least very distorted in your understanding of what reality of Father God is all about. That is why I'm asking us to put aside our mistaken conclusions for just a moment 
as we look at these three passages from the Word of God. Revelations, precise revelations of Father God, and we will have that clarity that we need because Christ is the clearest revelation of Father God you will ever receive. All other conclusions have only delivered an experience for you of empty disappointment filled with anger, resentment, and anxiety. And if we could, for just a moment, consider the claims of Jesus Christ, that he is God in the flesh, we might find what we're looking for this Christmas. We might find, instead of anger, resentment, and anxiety, we might find peace, we might find the love of God, we might find joy in the Lord. So you ready for that? Let's start. We're going to begin with a passage in the Old Testament. It's found in Isaiah chapter 9, if you got your Bibles. I want to hear the fluttering of Bible wings going around. Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah, the prophet, says this, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end of the increase of his government of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of the hosts will accomplish this. Amen. The Bible tells us long ago that Isaiah looked forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And he received a revelation from Father God. And he said, I'm going to reveal myself in a baby. A son will be born and given. In a child, born in human flesh like any other person. And in this ordinary event would be an extraordinary impact on the world around us. We know about this revelation of Isaiah because he wrote it down and the people he shared it with, they all recorded it so that you could have it today and you could hear about it. Although God reveals himself to those who are paying attention, a lot of us aren't paying attention. And it is those who have written down these prophecies when God spoke, Isaiah made sure it was passed on and recorded so that we could know about it, so we could hear from the Lord. The Lord is speaking to us through this passage recorded within the Word of God. And most of us would never know that Jesus Christ was coming, and when, even when he arrived, a lot of people missed the moment because they were not paying attention. And the question is, are we paying attention right now to what the prophet is telling us? If you listen carefully, all around you today, you will hear people say or that they are seeking to find a loving God. And they're looking for that loving God, that Father God in their lives. Now, they don't say it that way. They say it in a negative way. They don't say it in a positive way. They say it in a negative way. Have you ever found a backwards compliment? Well, you don't look half ugly today, you know, things like that. We have a negative way of saying things, right? We, we mean uh, positively, but we say it negatively. We're kind of bizarre that way. That's just the way we are. And if you listen carefully, people say, I'm looking for a loving God, but in a negative way they state it. We are, and I meet a lot of them, angry at our fathers and mothers for not giving us the love we need, and we demand that they acknowledge that they are responsible for our problems and our failures. We are upset with how families have failed us, and we are looking for some justice for all the wrong done to us in our generation. Children scold the world for all that is wrong with it, for ruining the environment, because it's all your fault. How dare you? All of this, all of it, rests on one idea that there must be something better than that, a standard that they have not yet found. And yet, we should be held to. 
And what is that standard that we're all outreached that we're not reaching, that we demand that our fathers and our mothers and the world leaders, everybody else measure up to, that they have failed us? All of this rests on the idea that there must be a better father than the fathers we have known. A better judge than the judges we have known. A better government than the governments we have known. A better life than the one we are experiencing right now. Guess what? There is. It exists. Isaiah tells us here in the Bible that God was coming in the baby Jesus Christ. Everything we are looking for, that better world, that better father, that better existence in life, Isaiah predicts would come in Jesus Christ. This happened over 2,000 years ago when Jesus arrived in historical record. We know it happened. Those who have come to experience Jesus Christ through being born again, as it says in John 3, now celebrate every Christmas around the world because they have discovered that there is a better world, a better father, a better love than we could have ever imagined. When you repent of your sins and you believe and receive Jesus Christ, you get a new king, you get a new father, you get a new government. Who doesn't want a new government? <laughs> In him, you get the ideal, the best of all you have longed for from earthly fathers, from earthly governments and counselors, you get it in Jesus Christ. And all it requires is repentance and receiving and forgiveness. You receive in Jesus all of this because remember what Isaiah says here. He is the responsible governor. He is the wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the eternal father, the prince of peace. Because Jesus Christ is all these things. He brings a government of peace, of justice, and of righteousness to anyone who will receive him as their king. This is a kingdom within where God reigns in your heart when you repent of your sins and receive him through salvation. It is a kingdom that changes your heart rather than the person you're annoyed with, unless you're annoyed with yourself. Then that works out wonderfully. <laughs> Jesus wants you to find the change in your heart. It isn't that he isn't going to change this world, because one day he will, but you will miss the benefit of that change if that change doesn't happen within you first, before it happens on the outside. In Jesus Christ, Father God reveals his love, for all of humanity, even the ones you don't like, he loves. This is the core of the Father God's heart for you today. This is his absolute essence. For God is love. He is agape. He loves you and Jesus Christ bore the consequences of our sins upon the cross. No motive, no motive by which we know his character is more important than his redeeming love. And all these things he could do don't compare to the one thing he did do for you when he gave his only begotten son. And that brings us to the most popular verse of the day, John 3 again. And we'll look at 1621. If the Lord is repeating a passage to you, he wants you to get the point. Here we go. John 3, 16 to 21. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light. For the deeds they had were evil, 
For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be made manifest as having been wrought in God. Christmas is all about candles, not presents. It's about the light. The light that God brings through the light of his love and the revelation he has made to us, the clearest revelation of God we'll ever have in Jesus Christ. We light candles because the light up a dark room is important. Light gives us ability to see in darkness. It warms up the place on a cold night. It gives you a peaceful feeling. And as winter grows darker and deeper and colder, we want warmth of light. We want that warmth, that sight, and even comfort during cold winter nights. The most important truths we experience in our lives are captured by symbols because truths need to be incarnated in some way so we can understand them. Truths like faith, hope, love, all these things are captured by light. The eternal truth guides us, comforts us, it gives us hope for a better day, a spring that somewhere around the corner might come. Do you ever notice that on Canadian weather forecasts, it's always warming in four days? <laughs> and four days from now, it'll get colder again, and they'll correct it, but they'll promise you another four days, it'll get warmer again. I think it's a standard to give Canadians hope that you don't need to flee to Florida, just hang on for four more days. <laughs> the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ says, no matter how dark, how cold, how austere, how lonely your life can be, it's not going to last forever. The Lord is coming. We have a hope in Jesus Christ, and we have the current light of his love in our hearts when we receive him. Do you love the light of Christ? Do you hunger for the light of revelation that flows from the Bible, the Word of God? And then you will be drawn to that light, and you will follow Jesus Christ, and he will lead you into a better world, a better government, a better rule over your life. Even as the world is lost and crazy, you will find what you really need. The world will look very different when you walk by the light of Jesus Christ. Today, this very day, as they did when Jesus Christ was born, many fear the light, and they hide from its searching beams that expose who they really are. When we sleep, we dream of being and doing many incredible things. Aren't you just younger, thinner, stronger, brighter, smarter, and successful when you dream at night? I got a whole nine hours sleep last night, nine hours of success in my life, and then I woke up. <laughs> Looked in the mirror, oh my goodness, that's not the person I was dreaming about. <laughs> the harsh reality of the light of day is something else. In our dreams, we can fly, we can do amazing things, we can create worlds the way we want them to be. And when we wake, we stumble into our bathrooms and look in the mirror. Dreams quickly give way to reality. Modern advice that you're getting today amounts to this. Just go back to bed. <laughs> dream the dream you want to be. But the Bible says, wake, O oh sleeper. Wake up and let God deal with your reality. Don't dream your life away. Jesus advised you to step into the light. So what is plainly seen in the mirror and realize that you need to repent, you need to turn, you need to change. Then move your eyes towards the flame of God's truth and let the Holy Spirit burn away the sin sickness in your soul. In our modern world of rational and irrational answers, we attempt to deal with the question of meaning. What is it all about? And more and more people are turning to the Bible for solutions. Did you know that? There's a little Bible app, it's called YouVersion uh, of the Bible, and you can put it on your phone. And just uh, they've just reported, just this one app, 
that uh, that scripture app has been downloaded 50 million times. 50 million. Just that one app. And there is 478 Bible verses which have been shared with others throughout this last year. I, it's great to hear that people are hungry for the Word of God, even if it's on an app. And do you know what the number one most read scripture on that app is? No, it's not John 3.16. It should be. We're, we love it here. It's Philippians 4.6. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. That's the number one passage on that app today. The secular world, the world that has no place for God, because that's what secular means. God is not allowed. The secular world has no place for God. And the compromised religions of the world and the religious have watered down the word of God. And they have left people, as a result, feeling anxious and afraid. And when you are anxious and afraid, you can be controlled by other people. Fear makes you a puppet. If you discover the light of God's word, and if you stand on the promises that God makes you to you as an individual by faith, you become strong and courageous and bold in the things of God. You will need that strength for what is coming. It is the fearful that tyrants control, but it is God's church, God's people, standing on the word of God that have stood down and challenged tyrants. And we've been doing it ever since Rome. And we win because we stand on the word of God. The secular world just can't comprehend what we get. It isn't fear and anxiety that they are filled with, thinking the world will end in 12 days. Well, I'm telling you, the world might end today or tomorrow when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. 12 years? Well, that's a remarkably long time. God is the Father you have looked for. He is your ideal. He loves you like no one else ever could. He wants the very best for you. Father, God has given you a way to come back home if you would repent and turn from all the things you know to be wrong. And he has created you in love and he desires you to be his child. He wants to counsel you. He wants to defend you. He wants you to push aside every fear and anxiety you have in your life. He wants to have a growing trust in you and in every promise he has ever made. But he is also coming to answer a cry, and that cry that we have on our lips is a cry for justice, a cry for evil people to pay for what they have done, and Jesus is coming to do just that. This, too, is his love, and he will not let evil continue, but he will overcome it. This is what we call a judgment day, uh, that day is coming. And that brings us to our last verse, Luke 21. Luke chapter 21, verses 25 to 28. Jesus records these words, and uh, recorded by Luke as he shared it with his apostles. They were asking about the end of the world, and these are what cr the words that Christ said. Verse 25. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on earth dismay amongst the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the seas and waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Talk about climate change, right? Verse 27, then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. 
But when these things begin to take place, straighten up, lift up your head, because your redemption is drawing nigh. If you listen to the media, they are getting you ready for something. (laughs) Take notes now after you've heard this message. Here's what they're getting you ready for. Number one, global collapse of the ecosystem. That, uh, and, they, and we're all going to die in 12 years, they say. Number two, for a coming alien encounter <laughs> in the next new age of humanity. It's a common script you'll hear. Number three, they're getting you ready for the evolution in DNA and the science that will make you have godlike abilities. They're getting you ready for a one-world peace through social engineering and global government. They're getting you ready for the abolishment of money, the abolishment of privacy, freedom of thought, speech, and most of all, religion. They're getting you ready for the raising of our children by the government, who will do a far better job than parents. And they're getting you ready for the death of all those who are burdened to the state and in opposition to the state. I am not a conspiracy person. These points are simply what I see and are on the television and on mass media all the time. And I've heard this from mass popular media every time I turn around. And if you look at that list I just give you, you will see it too. I am just one lone, I won't say little, but one lone preacher. And I'm just standing before you today telling you of a loving Father God who's trying to get you ready for a judgment of all evil in this world. We have all cried for justice and for evil to end. When will we be delivered? How long, O Lord? Well, he is coming. And I've heard people say there is no answer to the question of why there is so much pain and suffering. There is an answer. It's on its way. One day it will end. Every tear will be wiped away. Every grace be given. And the judgment day will come. There is an answer. It's just not arrived. But it is around the corner. We've all cried for it. He is coming to bring judgment. But it's not just to your favorite few that he's bringing a judgment. The judgment is for everyone, for anyone who ever lived, for everyone in this room, for everyone who hears what I'm saying today, that judgment is coming. Some will pull out their religious cards when that judgment day comes and says, I'm a card-carrying believer and I should be allowed in. Some of us will pull out philosophy cards Uh, but they don't really mean anything on that judgment day before that court. On that great judgment day, it is not what you know, it's who you know that matters. My loving Father God has given me a defense and wants to give you that defense as well. And my defense is this, it's Jesus Christ. He is my defense lawyer before the judgment throne of God. You can't hire him. His fees are way too high. You must know him as your Savior and Lord if he's going to be your defense on that judgment day. You must repent of your sins and ask for forgiveness if you will have a defense on that day before God's judgment. For the Bible tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I would teach that to children as I taught in schools and tell them about the Lord. I'd quote that verse, and then I would say to the little kids, but you know, that doesn't mean Pastor John, right? And they would all shake their heads. I mean, oh no, that means you too, Pastor John. Children knows what all have sinned means. They see it very clearly. It's when we grow older and justify ourselves that we forget it means us. 
This is essential for your defense, that you know this, that you believe this. And I will tell you why, so you will know what will happen on that great judgment day. I want you to get ready for court. That's why I'm here today. I have come clean with Jesus Christ. I have confessed my sins to him. And everything he convicts of me, as he convicts, I confess. I have asked for his forgiveness. I have turned away from those sins. And every day he helps, he guides, he counsels. He empowers me to fight the sin sickness in my body and soul through the Holy Spirit and through the inspired word of God, the Bible. We know each other well and have learned to trust each other well. The Lord and me know each other intimately. And we have learned through this testing of faith, for me disappointing him and him restoring me, we have developed a friendship. And this is essential for your defense as well, that you have that kind of walk. On that day of judgment, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You and I will stand before the court of heaven. And when the charges will be made and laid out before us, the books will be opened and everything I have ever done, said, and even thought will be exposed for everyone to see. I'm not looking forward to that. And on that day, there will be no false news, fake news, or false accusations. It will be all accurate and dead on. On that day, I will turn to Jesus Christ, as I do every day right now, and I'll ask him to deliver me. Because Jesus has promised me that on that day, because we have this relationship now, that on that day of judgment, he will defend me. He will be my defense and my righteousness, because he loves me, and I love him. He is my king. He is my Lord. He is my government. He is my counselor. This is the only way he will become your defense. He has promised to defend you on the day of judgment if you will receive him now. But his defense might shock you, and I want you to get ready for that because there are going to be some of you standing there before God in the judgment throne with your mouth hanging open wondering, what is my defense lawyer doing? When Jesus defends me, it won't be like you defend yourself. It'll be very unusual. And here's what's going to take place. Jesus will stand before Father God. The charges will be laid. I will be guilty. I will turn to Jesus Christ and say, Lord, defend me. And he said, no problem, John. I've got you. I promised I would, and I will. Just sit down and be quiet. So I sit down. Because, uh, you know, they say a person who defends himself in court is a fool, right? Don't defend yourself. Let Christ do it. Sit down and be quiet. Trust him. And he will stand before Father God, and this will be his defense. We have heard the charges against John, and we plead no contest. He's guilty. I said, wait a minute. (laughs) Sit down. (laughs) I know what I'm doing. He's guilty. And the verdict, according to the law, is death, separation from God and eternal punishment in hell. And we demand that verdict be delivered immediately. I say, wait a minute. This is not going well. What kind of defense lawyer have I got? And Jesus will say, sit down, be quiet. And then he will say, but wait a minute. He'll roll up his sleeves, and he'll show the nail prints in his hands. And he said, John has already been tried. The crime has already been punished. He can't be tried again. It's called double jeopardy if you do that. The price has been paid. Even though he is guilty, he can't be charged again. He has already come to judgment. The price has been paid. I have paid it. I declare this null and void. He can't be charged. He is a part of the family of God. And God will smile, slam down the uh, the hammer, and he'll throw the case out. There can be no charges made against me, not because I'm innocent, because I am guilty, but because the price has already been paid. 
You might think that you're not ready for that day. But if you know Jesus, he can be your defense too. And this is love. It was love that we were promised that God would reveal himself in Jesus Christ. It was love that Jesus Christ came and died upon the cross. And we have yet to know the fullness of his love when his promise is made real and Jesus defends you on that judgment day. Jesus Christ is your defense. Do you want Jesus Christ to be your defense? There will be many who will stand before the Lord God and argue and justify and blame other people for why they messed up. None of it will stand. They will be found guilty. The only one that will ever be pronounced forgiven are those who throw themselves at the mercy of Jesus Christ today. We walk in faith and hope and love of God through this dark, sin-sick world with courage and strength in the Holy Spirit and on to the promise that we have and the love in Jesus Christ with all that you have when you receive Jesus Christ. Could we read John 3 one more time? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. If you don't know the Lord, you can know him today. Wouldn't you want to embrace that kind of love? You can come forward in this moment and do that right now going to ask you to do something just very quietly, which is just bow your heads with me for a moment and close your eyes. I want us to have a conversation with God, and it's just you, nobody else in this room. You have heard God's word and his promise. The Holy Spirit is here and talking. If you're here today and you are anxious and worried and you have not stood on these promises and you want to know that you're ready for what is coming, that you have Jesus as your defense, but you don't know that yet, I'm going to ask you with your heads bowed, no one looking around, just to raise your hand in the air and say, I am anxious. I don't know that I am ready for that judgment day. Is that you today? I want you to know that peace in your heart. If that's you today, and if the Lord is speaking to you, then I want you to know the Lord's joy in your heart. I would like you, in this quiet moment, just to say in your heart what you need to before the Lord, to confess the sins that he convicts you of. Admit to him, then take responsibility for your life and don't dodge it anymore. Just confess it and say, own up to it, take responsibility. Because Jesus loves you, you can do that. He'll listen to you. And for every one you mention, he'll say, yeah, I know about that one too. Then ask him to forgive it, that the price he paid would be applied to every one of those sins. And receive that forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. Receive it now by faith and say, Lord, I accept it. I receive it, every one I have given to you. And then make him your king. Say, Lord, I want you to be in charge of my life. Obviously, I'm not doing a good job. I want you to take charge. If you lead, I will follow. If you teach, I will listen. If you guide, I will pay attention. And Lord, I believe you will. Lord, I thank you for every person here today who's making that commitment. There are some people here today, Lord, I believe they're making a recommitment to that. Because, Lord, it is a task in this world to follow and to be obedient. Thank you, Lord, that you're getting us all ready for that great judgment day and what you're about to take place. And I thank you for your willingness and your offer to be our defense today. 
and we need you desperately. But I pray, Lord, that we would make those choices long before that day comes, that we begin that walk of faith, that trust, that we will grow in love for one another so that on that day I'll know you and you'll know me. And that will make all the difference in the world, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen.